Hello and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining United Way of Southwest Alabama and the South Alabama Coalition of Nonprofits for our August 23 uh, DEI session. Today we're going to focus on employment support and uh, ADA, ADA compliance support and other just wraparound services that are available to those living with disabilities in our community. And um, we're just grateful that you've taken the time to join us or view this recording on our United Way YouTube page. And now I am going to turn it over to our facilitator of today's call, Mr. Brad Martin. He is our VITA program manager at United Way and we are grateful that he had time to do this with us today and he will introduce our panelists. So Brad. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for being here. Um, I, I, you know, when I was asked to do this presentation, it was kind of in the context. Um, and I think it's a good one to consider that in an era when it seems like everyone is saying, oh, everybody's having trouble finding employees. And meanwhile, growing up and, and as I've worked in the work world for 20 something years, what we hear is that persons with disabilities are among the most underemployed and unemployed. The question becomes, how do we fix both problems at the same time? Are there ways to perhaps educate others um, about the abilities of persons living with disabilities to, to fill those work positions in a good positive way, um, thereby solving the labor force crunch and also helping people who are traditionally under and unemployed to become employed. So I thought it was a great topic um, and I'm grateful to all of you for being here and especially to our guests. Um, and what I thought I would do is go around to each of you um, and let you tell everyone. I think everyone has been, most of you have been, have received the biographies of everybody, but I figured I would let each person go through and tell you um, a little bit about themselves and their background and, and what they are, are bringing to the table today. I'll go ahead and start just to set an example or to give an example, I should say. Um, so my name is Brad Martin. And what I bring to this discussion that is perhaps unique to this room is that I am totally blind. Um, I have been working in one job or another for about 20, almost 27 years now. Um, and I've been very fortunate because I have been working almost nonstop um, since I got out of college. So I'm very grateful for that. But I've also had a lot of supports around me that made that possible. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. Um, I want to start with uh, Addie Ray. If you'll tell us a little bit about your background and, and what your company uh, does as well, so that people can kind of get an idea of where you're coming from. Yes, so technically my name is Constance, but everyone calls me Addie. Um, I was born and raised in the Mobile area. Interesting fact, I used to live in the same house that I grew up in. Um, as far as my disability goes, I have CP, cerebral palsy. I use a wheelchair full time. Um, it does affect my ability to drive, all that being said, I do have my own business, Access for All LLC. And what Access for All LLC does is ADA compliance and disability inclusion consulting. I focus on a lot of educating the public, which is why I'm here today. That goes into public speaking. And when I'm not public speaking, I do facility evaluations where I can literally go into a place of business, look at it from top to bottom and tell people what needs to be done in order for accessibility issues to be corrected. And um, when I'm not doing that, I do dabble in research in relation to how um, accessibility improvements are funded. Thank you, excellent, excellent, excellent start. Um, 
and and I know that you'll be able to give us some in, in some feedback and and we'll talk through the hour about different things uh, and different types of disabilities and some of the supports that that people find necessary and and um, you'll be able to help us with that quite a bit I do believe. Um, Dr. Peebles, if you will give us a little background on you and what the Independent Living Center does in the community, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, first of all, I am a black male in his early 40s. I'm wearing a black shirt with, unfortunately, receding hair. Um, I'm as Brad said, my name is Dr. Peoples. I'm the Chief Executive Officer here at the Independent Living Center of Mobile. The Independent Living Center of Mobile is one of over, over 300 uh, currently funded independent living centers throughout the country. Uh, we provide System advocacy, individual advocacy, information and referral, um, skills and training, uh, and, and uh, institutions and community, community reintegration or institutional diversion for individuals with disabilities and one of the things that we pride ourselves here on at the individual living center of Mobile, we have a focus on those with uh, intellectual disabilities and high physical support needs. So we also are a provider to the Medicaid home and community based waiver system. We provide personal, personal care, day supports, customized employment supports, uh, and other therapeutic services for individuals, uh, for individuals to really uh, support, maintain, and of community, live, community living in the most integrated setting. I am also an individual with uh, spastic cerebral palsy, um, which for those of you who don't know, has to do with a lack of oxygen to the brain at or near birth at the level of severity for it nature of the impairment with the cerebral palsy has to do with the area of the brain that was deprived of oxygen and still lengthened the deprivation. For example, you can have someone that has a very slight walking gait what has some cognitive processing issues or a specific learning disability or someone like myself who is cognitively intact but has severe physical impairment to the point of functional quadriplegic um, where I'm reliant on support for assistance with all my activities with daily living. And, and historically, people with my level of impairment have had difficulty obtaining and maintaining full-time employment, full-time competitive employment at, you know, for any period of time, whether that's access to educational opportunities or other artificial barriers that have been put in place by various means tested circumstances programs. 
So that's a little bit about me. Um, I do a lot of community service and other things that you can read about in my bio, but, but, um, but the rest of, the rest, the rest of, the rest of me will come out in the course of the rest of our conversation today. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. And, um, you know, I think what's going to make this panel strong is that we're all coming at it from different angles and different um, circumstances. And so, and, you know, one of the things that we know is that each, not only is each disability different, sometimes diametrically different, but also persons who even have the same condition need different supports as well. So I'm grateful for the variety of perspectives that we have today. Um, let me switch gears a little bit. And Beth Hanks, if you'll tell us a little bit about what you do with the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services and, and, and how that fits into this puzzle that we're building today. Sure. Thanks, first of all, for allowing me to be part of the conversation. Um, I have been with the Alabama Department of Rehab Services for 24 years. I started as a welfare to work counselor during the welfare reform movement in 1999. I moved into a transition counselor position in which I assisted high school students with disabilities into employment as they transitioned from high school to college and or employment. And in 2012, I became a supervisor for vocational rehab services. Um, the Alabama Department of Rehab Services, we are a state agency whose goal is to enable Alabama's children and adults with disabilities to achieve their maximum potential. So we have four divisions, um, and I'll run through those briefly and then um, pass it on back to you. Um, our early intervention division provides services to children with developmental delays, um, ages birth to three. Our children's rehab division provides special health care services to children with special health care needs. They do um, lots of clinics for orthopedics, physical, uh, physical therapy, uh, just children that have special health care needs that need additional services, and that's ages 3 to 21. They also run the state of Alabama hem hemophilia program as well. Um, we have an independent living program, the CELL program, state of Alabama independent living. They provide um, in-home services to individuals with uh, the most significant disabilities that would require nursing home level care. They have an independent living specialist on board, a nurse, and then um, homebound and cell counselors that go into the home to provide those services. And then my division is the vocational rehab division, and our goal is to provide services to eligible individuals with disabilities to improve opportunities for employment. Um, I'm on the general side, which means that um, we, our general VR general program serves high school students and adults with all kinds of disabilities except sensory impairments. Uh, the sensory impairments are served by our blind and deaf division. Got it. And um, I've worked with some of the folks in the past in the blind division, of course. Um, so I'm familiar with that and I'm glad for the opportunity to share um, that availability of, of, of services with the larger community. Um, I think where I want to go next is to talk a little bit about, um, and I'm going to start with Addie because it most directly feeds into what you were talking about when you started. Um, what is the process for, say, an employer who might want to hire somebody with a disability um, to determine? Because I think one of the challenges that we have is employers aren't sure what they can ask us as the potential employee. And so how do employers become better informed about what types of accommodations would be necessary in order to hire someone with a particular disability? Right. Well, the, um, the basic definition, as I understand it, of what can be asked is really, can you... Um, perform the basic functions of whatever the job description is with um, or without accommodation. Um, it does go a little deeper than that, I would have to say from personal experience. Mind you, part of the reason I went into entrepreneurship is even though I was receiving vocational rehab services and still am, 
I just came to the decision that a nine to five job as per what pertains to commutes and that sort of thing wasn't really a good fit for me and my goals. It really is a very personalized process. But I will say for one that decides to go through the um, initial uh, interview process for a nine to five job, that, that that is, you know, an employer's main concern is will this potential employee be able to perform the essential functions of their job description? Right. And here's my question to you, Beth. Um, do you, and maybe if you're not the person to speak to this, um, I'm, I'm thinking Dr. Peoples will have something to say about it as well. But, you know, one of the things I always wondered as a, an applicant for jobs is what the employer is allowed to ask me about how, you know, people have their own ideas about how you do things, how you use a computer, how you, how do you read the screen if you can't read the screen? And 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 I've never been clear, and it, I've had a wide array of experiences um, as far as what they legally are supposed to be able to ask me and what they are not. And I've always found, I've often found myself trying to predict what questions people might have that they're afraid to ask. So given that we're talking with a bunch of people who could potentially employ someone, how will we make them feel more comfortable asking the right questions and avoiding the wrong ones? Um, let me say, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't have, um, I don't want to, I don't want to tell anybody wrong, but when I'm doing an interview, cause I hire now as a supervisor, we can ask what Addie just said, can you perform the essential functions of the job with or without accommodations? We are not allowed to ask if somebody says, yes, I can perform it with accommodations. We should not then go into, well, tell me what your disability is. That's not, it's not necessary to disclose it, especially when the disability is hidden. Um, I think if the person answers the, the question, yes, they can perform the job and they're the, the right candidate for the job, then once the employee gets on the job, then you begin discussing what kinds of things, whether it's assistive technology, whether it is a, a raised desk, a different type of chair. Um, then we ask those questions how to, how to help that individual perform that job but we should not be asking uh questions about a person's disability now again not a lawyer but those are the kinds of um that's kind of the way that i handle it as a supervisor within our department good to know and and i think that's right um you know my experience is i i tend to be an over communicator uh, and I'm I'm coming from this not as the employer, but as the person applying for a job. So I tend to perhaps overshare what I what technology or what accommodations I do use. Would you say that that's probably not advisable in the interview stage? It sounds like you're saying kind of wait until you're hired and then have that conversation, which feels a little awkward to me. And I'm just curious what your experience has been with that. I think... Um... I think it's different based on your disability. I think when you go into an interview, Brad, given the fact that you have a visible disability, it's going to be a lot easier for you to say, here's my disability. If you want to disclose that, I think that's perfectly fine. Here's my disability and here's what I'm going to need. I, I think every situation is different. And I think um, I don't think it's wrong to over communicate um, what you need. Um, I don't know that you would want to go in guns and blazes and saying this is what I have to have if you're going to hire me. I just think it comes down to the right kind of communication, um, and a, a lot of it is going to depend on the disability, in my opinion. Again, just my opinion. <laughs> by my, uh, by my yes, go ahead. The the the, the, my, the general rule of thumb from the employment perspective is. Better to ask as it's better to ask as it's better to ask as little as possible, you know, because that will keep you out of ADA EOC jeopardy. So so but the, but my approach is always there's a part of this too that falls upon the applicant because 
Because they do the thing when they when they look at when they look at a job post at percent, you know, they need to be working at the essential functions of the post and start to conceptualize what do I need in order for this function. In other words, know the solutions that work for you. You may have to modify the solutions depending on the employment environment and the specific culture and culture and private of the job itself for the organization, but know what the successful strategies have been in your life to be productive in doing such an act. That is why I say, but for thank you, because we've had this conversation ourselves, is a lot of what I do when I look at the job as an applicant is I say, you know, or work for me while I was in, or work with me when I worked for me as far as accommodations when I was in the training setting. Well, I, well, I know I need, when we know I need certain, certain people to the technology, well, I know I need accessible restrooms with certain modifications. I know I need, uh, you know, Permission from the employer to have enough money. Non employer sponsored personal assistant come on site and help me with ADL skills during the day. Well, I know I need transportation just not to get to it from the office, but also in a commuting sense, but also in, but also in uh, executive sense. I need to be able to participate in community functions for leadership this agency that are in between my map rides to and from the office. I need, need to make to those things. So my thing is think about think about the essential functions of the as listed. And then how can I possibly achieve, what do I need to achieve those, those objectives in a superior way and support the employer? You may not disclose, you may not disclose that in the interview, and I suggest you don't disclose your methods during the interview, but, but at least have those strategy, at least have those strategies thinking in your head, but right? even if you're submitting a resume and so yeah, whatever application process is, once the offer has been made, then you can start to verbalize to your HR director or supervisor, these are the things I know I need, these are the things I know I need, and, and no, this is doesn't always have to be at the financial cost of the employer. That's when, that's when I mean, we can engage with Beth or, or Angela or Harriet deep in the mobile ADRS office to say, can you provide these hard assets to allow me to complete the essential functions of my job. And that is something that vocational rehabilitation in Alabama very, very good at is, you know, if, a, if, a, if a consumer knows what they need or, or understands the functions of their job, knows, 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 knows the methodology for completion, they could go to ADRS and to say, I need X, Y, Z, or even if they don't, 
that are special, that are special people that are on that staff of rehab engineers that could actually come in, watch you in the job and burn and make recommendations about, make recommendations about, make recommendations about products or services that can, that can allow the person to do the job at minimal cost to the employer or the employee. And that's, that's a great segue into um, where I was about to go. And you kind of touched on it, which is, you know, I'm 48, right? So I've been in the work world a long time. I kind of know what works, what doesn't. I know what technology is out there. I know what um, services are out there, or at least I, I'd like to think that I do. Uh, if when I was 20 or 21 and I didn't know any of that stuff, um, it was a lot more intimidating to go into an interview for fear that I wouldn't know the answers and the employer wasn't allowed to ask the questions. And so my thoughts were always racing to what if they have assumed I can't do X or I can't do Y and I don't know what they're thinking and they don't know what I can do. Um, but to go back to what you were saying, so Beth, what type, he was saying that you you guys have people on staff who can go out and do um, sort of assess what, what might be helpful. Is that correct? And also, Addie, I'll get to you in a minute because I think you can do some of the same things. Uh, yes, we do have staff. Uh, we have a rehab engineer um, who will go out to the work site, um, talk to the participant in the office, but look at things that may be needed in order to help that individual do the job. And they have to keep up with technology. I'm going to be stuck in an iPhone 5 mode for years now, and I'm not going to be able to keep up with things. But our rehab engineers are supposed to keep up with the technology that makes people's jobs easier. You know, if you've got a learning disability, they may recommend a note taking strategy or a talk to text strategy to help make sure you're able to input your data in the right way. Um, again, raised desks, uh, ergonomic desks, or ergonomic positioning if you've got an orthopedic impairment. So there are lots of things that even I am not aware of that our rehab engineer may recommend in order to help somebody get a job or keep a job. You know, if someone becomes disabled while they're an employee, we also want to try to help that individual maintain that job if they can. So uh, we have a program called Ray Retaining a Value Employee that also is to help the employer and the individual newly disabled individual maintain their job. But we do have a rehab engineer on staff. There are also specialists on the sensory side um, that can do um, a common, uh, uh, evaluations to determine what might be needed for a person who has um, blindness or deafness, low vision or, or hard of hearing. Gotcha. And that's what's so funny is everything you do for, I always think it's, I always laugh. This is just a humorous aside for me because I went to the school, the regional school for the deaf and blind. And I always think it's funny. They put those of us who are blind with those of us who are deaf and we can't talk to each other. And everything you do for one is completely opposite for the other. And yet people tend to think of them the same way, um, or at least as because they're both sensory impairments, but it's funny how completely opposite they really are. Um, that's important. And Addie, tell me this. Um, so what if some if when you say you go out to sites to evaluate, what would that sort of session look like for the um, for either the employer or the person who is 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 trying to get employed? Well, well mind you, um, when I go out and do evaluations, it's kind of a whole other spectrum than what you're thinking it is, Mr. Martin or Brad, if you prefer Brad. Um, but in any case, when I go out and do those evaluations, um, I'm not necessarily working with a potential employee. I'm working with the potential employer to make sure that their environment um, is going to be accessible to a potential employee with a disability. In Got other it. words, I focus on the physical. For instance, if you're going away wide enough or your counter is the correct height or your restroom is set up appropriately which is a whole different spectrum. It falls under Title III. But it's also important because it's yeah. one of those things that people do not think about when they, you know, are, are, are either when they buy a building, when they lease a building, when they construct a building, 
um, you know, I have, a, I had a teacher um, whose son kind of did what you did. I think he may have done it for the, for the federal government or something. This was decades ago. Um, but she said people would, and this was back before the ADA or right around the time that the ADA was coming into existence. And she said people would build parking lots and they would mark off handicapped spaces thinking, oh, we have handicapped parking, but it was farthest away from the building. They had no understanding. And I think we've come a long way since then. At least I like to think so. But they had no understanding why that they just thought you marked spaces for people who were handicapped. They didn't understand why they needed to be close to the building or um, when I was in college, we did a, a documentary for a class. I was a broadcast major, so we were doing film production. And we demonstrated some of the ways in which the college was not accessible, particularly to for someone in a wheelchair. Um, that there were steps everywhere and 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 cobblestone sidewalks that would just be really hard to, maneuver um and so those are the things i think that sometimes people i think some of them people think about because they're they see it all the time and yet some things you don't think about i think the accessible restrooms and the countertops and things like that are things people don't think about my sister bought a house once that had light switches that were really low and we were like, why are these light switches so low? And then it finally occurred to us, because if you're in a wheelchair, you probably need them to be. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. Um, I, I'm lucky enough to have a particular special kind of wheelchair that allows me to stand. Um, but not everybody is going to be able to do that. And it's, it's also just a matter of natural height. I mean, if you look at your average height light switches, they're at least... I don't have a tape measure with me, mind you, but they're at least almost six feet from the floor. So my right. wheelchair is going to be able to lift, reach six feet. And I'm thinking with the light switch in this office here, which that's another whole joke. Everybody laughs in my office because I don't turn the light on because I don't think about it because um, I don't need it. And but it, it that switch is definitely high. I don't know. Um, it, you would need something to be able to reach it for sure. That's true. See, these are the things I think that we need to think about, um, not just from the from the perspective of the technology, but just the the barriers. And again, that's why we wanted the variety of perspectives that we have. Um, I would like to see if um, either from the chat or if it just in general, if, if the audience has any questions about um, accessibility barriers, whether that is as far as doing the job or just navigating your facility. Are there any questions out there? Brad, this is Triska. There's none in the chat, but if you have a question, feel free to unmute and ask. Uh, here we go. Well, there's a question now. What are some of the ways to reach applicants? So I assume, Diane, you're asking about how to find people who um, may be seeking employment. That's a great topic we haven't in investigated yet. So is there a way to get matched with an employer, if I am someone other than, you know, going through the usual job search features, are there ways to connect through an agency um, to find employment? Uh, can, I, can I take this one? This is Beth. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Peebles. I will, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you your credit card. You're gonna, you can stop, but you can expound on but, there are incentives. There are incentives and pathways through federal civil service, through through the Department of Labor in the state, through uh, the uh, under the under uh, the business the business engagement division of ADRS that they have they they also you know, keep abreast of available opportunities for research and business engagement. 
do. So that, you know, go on about that. But the there is the federally funded workforce centers that are out there that, that have a relationship sometimes fit, sometimes even a physical breath breath physical uh, presence from the uh, the vocational rehabilitation agencies, and there's 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 nexus there. So yes, there are there are public incentives for there are public incentives and pathways. That's one further the 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 actual employer engagement that you have in your office. Um. If you are an employer and you want to hire a person with a disability, please call um, Alabama Department of Rehab Services. We have business relations consultants on staff that go out and meet with employers. They're, they have a dual customer, in fact. They're supposed to serve an employer and help our consumers. But um, we, don't have, we don't have jobs. We don't have things for our, our consumers to do. So um, as an employee, you could reach out to our office and um, the business relations consultant can get an idea about the kind of job you're trying to hire for. Um, they have access to caseloads, so we can look at what you're looking at in terms of what you need and try to match an individual within our agency that um, could benefit you and, and get a job at the same time. It's Lynn McDonald. Hey Lynn, how are you? I'm ready. How are you doing? I got to see this part. Um, Lynn, we've retained Lynn McDonald to uh, serve as our interim, C interim COO here at the Independent Living Center effective earlier this month. So I wanted Lynn to sit in on one of our first outreach activities since the near. I love it. Me Lynn and I go too. way back. Yes. I have a just a thought as an employer and a former employer. There isn't enough information to employers that accommodations don't have to cost the employer money that there are so many agencies available to assist an employer who hires someone who is able, but has a little bit of a disability. And I'm wondering if there's a way that this team can devise an outreach project, something that can go on media, that can go to employers, just the mom and pop employers don't know a thing about this. Because that's one of the barriers that Addie can talk about. Is, yeah, Addie can talk about. If your typical sole proprietorship are under the belief that the response for the responsible ability for reasonable accommodation is solely on the employer. Yeah. It's we. It is, it is not. It's a partnership between the employee, the employer, and the and whatever whatever community resources are available to help facilitate the help facilitate the accommodate. But if the employer doesn't know that, right, it stops there. Yes, um, I'll give you. A, I'll give you, I'll give a, a very a recent example. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very recent example. I was in an interview where, where, I'll be frank, I was in my interview for this job at the Independent Living Center, and one of the one of my board members who I do not name asked, asked me about my reasonable accommodation as they, as they shouldn't. And his question was, I just want that this was a layman, this was a board member, this was not 
and said, that, that's fine, as long as it doesn't come out of our budget. So there is a, I say that to say there is a misconception. Right. That the burden is exclusively on the employer to buy the estate combination, it's not. And that's important because you're absolutely right. It can be a barrier because people, again, and this goes back to the struggle of if you don't know what people are thinking and they're not allowed to ask you, then you have to be psychic and try to allay those fears without knowing for sure that they have them. And so um, I think it also, to your point, means that as the employee or potential employee, we also have to be aware of those resources so that we can point them out in the process of interviewing, unfortunately. I think that's just the reality. Um, interviewing more after the offer, more after the offer is made when the, when, the, when the barriers come down somewhat, it has a chance to be a little more cooperative, a little more cooperative um more cooperative conversation as opposed to exactly thank you i'm sorry i didn't hear that i said you won't get the offer if they think it's going to cost them more money correct so sometimes when we train persons to go into job interviews, we have to help them be aware that there's a real level of anxiety and fear on the part of an employer when somebody wheels in in a wheelchair or walks in with a white cane. And you know this, Brad. So the applicant has to be very comfortable with themselves, plop down, and let the potential employer know that the applicant is fully aware that they're disabled. We're not pretending, we're not playing games. No, I agree. And I think the challenge there um, is it's easy to say that at the age that I am now. It's yes. a lot harder to feel that way at 21. Yeah. That's our job. Yeah. I, and I, and I say that back to, you know, sitting, sitting in my interview with the IFC board, I felt a lot different than I did when I was interviewing for my first job as an undergraduate, getting out of school with an Air Force Brigadier, with an Air Force Brigadier General at, yeah, in an Air Force base in Ohio, where I was trying to get a civil. Uh, GS job, you know. So the 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 with ex it's with experience, it's with the individual applicant engaging in some let's call it pretty professional development, <laughs> um, you know, educating themselves on the resources that are out there, so that they can do. They can do to take the affirmative steps so they can make the they can make the disclosure as fully as as full as possible and in the right way. Right. Trista, were there any other I know there were some comments that I was kind of sort of hearing, but I had to make them stop so I could hear the, the conversation. Uh, everyone has been actively using the chat, Brad, and kind of asking questions about age restrictions or parameters for age as it relates to ADRS services. And Beth shared that they work with high school students and they work with senior citizens and that they can really work with any age as long as they have a disability and meet the eligibility requirements. There was a question early on about resources available for individuals who have disabilities that have been incarcerated. And so I didn't know, Beth, if you wanted to speak to that or not. Sure. Uh, yeah, we take uh, in applications on individuals who are coming back into our community um, that have a disability. 
uh, we will provide services to them just like anybody else. So um, sometimes it may be a little harder to get them a job, but we certainly want to try to help them get back into their community and become a, a productive citizen so that they don't reoffend. So yes, we, we can work with individuals who have been incarcerated. And there are some programs through the Career Center, I think, that also assist individuals who are returning back to the community um, that they may have some resources as well if they don't have a disability. That's and, that's and then Brad, there was another question about incentives and um, it just says, for example, when I worked at UCP of Mobile, their supportive employment staff actually handled some on-site trainings that benefited both employers and employees. That's a good, that's a good point, and I was giving you a good segue into what I would with the good famous part that I want to do, which is that, and I and Byron White at DMH and the folks are working on rolling out a collaboration that involves the next generation of supportive employment known as customized employment. So what that does is we engage in those people. We engage with, the, with folks who may not have had uh, the, the may not have had the opportunity to have an important, important choice to really do what we call uh, a meaningful discovery as to finding out what strengths, interests, and purposes are. Uh, and we can do this in many ways, uh, regardless of God, because the nature of the support needs for the individual. For our folks that are not non privileged communicators, aka non verbal, um, we, do an emer we do an immersion process that just is very, you know, think about the different community environments and just, just see that and see that both the reactions. You know, do that. And then we do what we call, where Beth talked about the backing, we, we take it to the next level of what we call uh, customizing employment and job development, where I say I have an employer, say I have an individual that has a love of children or love of pets, you know, and, you know, we match, we go to, the, you match the daycare or the animal shelter with, we say we get for somebody that can, you know, clean cages or, or, or exercise the animals or, 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 or whatever, whatever the case may be. You find, and employers that are in need of certain essential functions, and you match that, and you marry that with the strengths, interests, and abilities of the of the employees. I bet we we even heard examples from certain matter experts of ours, where we we needed placement for the individual with low with the head. Loads, loads, loads sensory inputs that need to the basic class. So, if this person had a disability that was a cousin to the autism spectrum, so the creation was that this person was clerical, was, was, was. Uh, head help or the penal partner doing all the things, holding the programs, setting up for the memorials, 
you know, the things that the professional staff needed to get done, but we really didn't, shouldn't have been wasting the professional staff budget. Things that, things that, things that someone with an interest in, you know, the need for a quiet environment could really do well with. Right. May I'm sorry. May I, may I add to that just a little bit in terms of incentives? Yeah. Um, we also there's a work opportunity tax credit to hire up for an employer to hire people with disabilities. We have services where we can do a paid work experience so that if a, an employer is not quite sure that the person has the skills, we can do a paid work experience for that individual to go on the job site, learn the job, and then if he and the employer, she and the employer are satisfied. Um, the goal is for them to go to work. Um, we do on the job training. So we pay half of a salary. If an employer is like, yeah, I want to hire this person, but can you help supplement the salary at 50%? We can do that. So there are quite a few services to employers to incentivize hiring a person with a disability as well. Yeah. I, I, I want to hear you say that rather than just volunteer your money. But yeah, I get that. But, you know, but, but um, that there are there are there are those incentives that so if we keep it in a training study that could could so, that does or could supplement the salary for at fifty percent at least for the ninety at least for the ninety days with their the arc at least for the ninety days with the arc is open. Or further. So, you know, there are others out there. Plus Good. We are coming close to our time. I want to give Addie the last word, though, and say this is just kind of, I guess, interesting trivia, but I think it's interesting. What is the, if you, if is there a particular accommodation that you find most people do not recognize is an issue until you point it out? Um, I, I would say it's, it's, not, it's, it's not really an accommodation per se, but um, I would say that from an entrepreneurial perspective, as I said, I work with you know, multiple um, departments, companies, et cetera, and I go in there and they say, wow, you've got your own business. Is that like a thing in the disability community? Um, uh, and, I will, and I will say, yes, it is. Um, it's, it's really the, uh, one of the best kept secrets, you might say, um, in the employer employee world. Um, it is not a decision to be made lightly, um, but it is, um, an option for those with disabilities. Um, and so I know that wasn't really your question, but have, having been only really needing to be accommodated in the most um, basic ways as far as transportation and that sort of thing and not being in a nine to five um, setting for long periods, it's not really an answer I can give. Um, but I will say that entrepreneurship within the disability community should not be ignored. And you know, in, in the blind community, there's a lot of that because there are a lot of blind folks who act as vendors in, in, in various places. And so that's a very common thing um, in, in the blind and low vision community. So that makes sense to me. Um, we are down to our last two minutes. So I wanna thank everyone, both our, our, our participants as well as our audience for joining us today. Um, and I, I hope that what we have done is kind of illuminated some of the challenges, but also some of the resources that are out there because I think that's the, I, I think Lynn has it right in that people don't know that there are incentives and that there are, uh, that if, if, if it's if it's a budgetary thing, I think that's where people go first. Um, and then panic sets in. I don't want to discriminate, but I also don't want to have to spend a bunch of money that we haven't budgeted for. And so I think we've covered a pretty wide array of topics. 
Um, we will make sure, um, and, and Trista can speak more to this, that if you have questions that we have not answered, we'll get those to the appropriate folks and get responses back to you. I'm going to turn it back over to Trista to, to do the wrap up. And um, I, I, again, I thank you for being here and I thank you for taking the time. Yes, I echo those thoughts, Brad. Um, as you see on your screen, we value your feedback and your guidance as we continue our DEI work and training series. Also, I would like to thank our sponsor for this session, and that is the Alabama Power Foundation. They awarded us grant funding to continue offering this service to our community. And last but not least, like Brad said, if there's some additional follow-up questions that you have for our panelists, feel free to email me. I'll pop my email in the chat and I will direct them or connect you directly with the, the panelists. So thank you all. Enjoy your uh, Friday afternoon and your weekend. We appreciate you.